the eastern provinces of what was East Prussia, where a vast wilderness of plains and forests, lakes and rivers. In August 1914, this wilderness witnessed German and Russian soldiers marching and fighting against the extremes of the parching heat and dust. On the Eastern Front, advances of hundreds of miles could be made, as opposed to the West, where a few miles gained would be at great human cost. The war on the Eastern Front would be decided in a small village called Tannenberg. The Germans and Russians went in confident that they would win and that the war would be over by Christmas. The Russian commander, Grand Duke Nicholas, aimed for Germany's capital, Berlin. The German general, Paul von Hindenburg, would be called upon to repel the Russian invasion. Tannenberg became the battle zone where Hindenburg and Grand Duke Nicholas clashed in one of the most momentous battles of World War I. At the end of the 19th century, France allied itself with Russia. Britain soon joined them. One of the great alliances in Europe, its aim was to prevent German domination of the continent. But Germany also had an alliance. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was in decline. Under the ambitious Kaiser Wilhelm, Germany was an evolving industrial and political power. On the surface, Europe was enjoying a rare period of peace, but tensions began to simmer in mid-1914. The breaking point came on June 28th, when the heir apparent to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie, were murdered in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo. The culprit was a Serbian separatist. The assassination ignited World War I. The great nations mobilized and prepared for war. On the Western Front, Germany faced France and Britain. On the Eastern Front, Germany and Austria opposed Russia. The German armies launched an immediate offensive in the West, hoping to vanquish France and Britain. But in the east, the German army was forced onto the defensive from the outset. Russia took the initiative and threatened to sweep the Germans out of East Prussia. The German supreme commander, General Helmut von Moltke, decided that only one man could turn the tide. General Paul von Hindenburg was brought out of retirement to save Germany. Born in 1847, Hindenburg was as handsome as he was determined. 
His family was from the traditional Prussian military aristocracy. Hindenburg became a military cadet and was commissioned at 18. He joined the elite Prussian foot guards in 1866. He fought with distinction in both the Austro-Prussian and Franco-Prussian wars and was decorated for bravery in 1870. Following the Franco-Prussian War, he stayed in the military and rose steadily through the ranks. Count Alfred von Schlieffen was due to retire in 1904, and Hindenburg, now a full general himself, was tapped to replace him. However, in 1905, during the final exercise of the annual military maneuvers, he had the misfortune of defeating the Kaiser. Realizing that this was not good for his career, Hindenburg resigned. He later wrote, my military career had carried me much further than I had dared hope. There was no prospect of war at the time, so I applied to retire. Although still an active patron of the military, including the Franco-Prussian War Veterans Association, Hindenburg became restless. Even when war erupted in August 1914, Hindenburg did not expect to be called to service. By the third week in August, General von Moltke, the German army commander, realized that things were not going well against Russia. He appointed General Erik Ludendorff as the new chief of staff in East Prussia. Von Moltke also needed a figurehead to oversee operations. One of his staff pointed out that Hindenburg lived conveniently close to the main railway line to the east. Von Moltke immediately approached him. Hindenburg needed no persuading and immediately boarded the train with Ludendorff to the front. Hindenburg was now on a journey to meet his destiny. In the east, the Russian commander-in-chief, the Grand Duke Nicholas, also had his eye on victory. Born in 1856, Grand Duke Nicholas was a member of the Russian aristocracy and also the uncle of Tsar Nicholas II. Unlike Hindenburg, his only taste of combat had been as an aide-de-camp to his father, Grand Duke Nicholas the Elder, during the Russo-Turkish War of 1887. Tall and imposing in stature, the Grand Duke was a good soldier, but because he was royalty, he was not allowed into field command. Nevertheless, he earned a reputation as a champion for reform in the Russian armed forces. This made him unpopular with some of the most senior staff in the Russian army. His biggest critic was General Yakov Jelinsky, the Russian military chief of the general staff, but they would serve together during the opening months of World War I. When the war began, the Tsar decided to declare himself supreme commander of the Russian forces. His generals realized that this would have dire consequences as the Tsar had no military experience and could not hope to command such a huge army. He was persuaded to step down in favor of his uncle, Grand Duke Nicholas, with Jelinsky as his chief of staff. In the first weeks of the war, Russian victories seemed to affirm the choice of Grand Duke as commander. 
He was confident that his armies would continue to sweep through to a decisive victory. But Nicholas would soon come upon General Paul von Hindenburg, a man of infinite military experience. Their confrontation would be critical to the future of both Russia and Germany. When the two sides went to war in August 1914, their armies deployed according to plans that had been drawn up and refined over many years. The German general staff based their strategy on Russia's road and rail systems limitations. Mobilization would not be speedy. Therefore, the Germans sent the bulk of its armies to the west. The German 8th Army, a relatively small force, was left to protect their eastern border. The Russian army aimed to strike quickly and decisively through East Prussia and then advance toward Berlin while holding the Austrians in the south. Berlin was Grand Duke Nicholas's ultimate prize. He believed that capturing Germany's capital would bring the war to a quick and triumphant end. The Russian steamroller, as the vast Russian army was known, mobilized and was on the move more quickly than the Germans anticipated. General Max von Prittwitz, known to his men as the Fat Soldier, commanded the German 8th Army in East Prussia. But he was a lackluster figure without any skill as a commander in war. On August 17, 1914, Grand Duke Nicholas launched his invasion of East Prussia. The Germans were caught by surprise and soon forced to withdraw. Thousands of German civilians became refugees. Spurred on by rumors of Russian savagery, they fled west. On August 20th, the Germans were defeated at Gumbinen. The German withdrawal continued. Grand Duke Nicholas maintained his advance This put Königsberg, the capital of East Prussia, under threat. Panicking, Prittwitz telephoned the German Supreme Commander, von Moltke, and demanded permission to withdraw from East Prussia. Von Moltke was grappling with problems of his own in the West and had little time for Prittwitz's indecision. The telephone conversation was brief and to the point. It ended Prittwitz's career. Meanwhile, the Grand Duke's armies kept moving forward. The Germans desperately began to prepare a new defense line in the rear. By August 23rd, Grand Duke Nicholas and his men were convinced that victory was in sight. The Grand Duke knew that he had a considerable advantage in numbers alone. 
he had two armies totaling 500,000 men under his command. The defending German 8th Army had less than 250,000 men. General Pavel von Rennenkampf commanded the Russian 1st Army in the north. The 2nd Army in the south was under the command of General Alexander Samsonov. He was expected to coordinate his advance with Rennenkampf and strike to the northwest. The Grand Duke's intentions were to cut off the German forces in East Prussia around Königsberg. The two armies would then advance toward Berlin. Hindenburg faced this grave situation when he arrived at the headquarters in East Prussia. But unlike Pritwitz, he and his chief of staff, Erich Ludendorff, could not accept defeat. Lieutenant Colonel Max Hoffmann, one of 8th Army's senior staff officers, devised a plan he thought would foil the Russians. Hoffmann had studied the situation map in great detail as the German troops retreated across the 100-mile-wide battlefront. He noted that General Alexander Samsonov's second army was at risk as it was beginning to press ahead of von Rennenkamp's first army in the north. Hoffman saw that the Missourian lakes lay between the two Russian armies. It was an impassable barrier, surrounded by forests and marshlands. Therefore, as Grand Duke Nicholas's commanders advanced, the chain of over 50 miles of continuous waterways would separate their armies this great natural obstacle would buy the Germans vital time. Hindenburg and Ludendorff agreed with Hoffmann that this was a situation they could exploit. Geography would allow the Germans to concentrate their forces against one Russian army and then the other. By chance, Hindenburg received vital intelligence from Russian headquarters. He could now draw up a plan to restore Germany's fortunes in the East. The Grand Duke staff had failed to encode many of the orders that they had sent by radio to Samsonov and Renenkampf. German intelligence confirmed that Samsonov was still advancing in the South. However, Rennenkampf's army was coming to a halt. Hindenburg decided that Samsonov was the more immediate threat and planned to attack him first. He had a vital asset in the well-developed railway system in East Prussia. Exploiting it to its maximum capacity, Hindenburg moved a substantial force south to strike against Samsonov's second army. In the meantime, he moved more troops by road to the south. He left a weak reconnaissance screen to guard the northern sector. Once he had dealt with the Russian threat in the south, Hindenburg calculated that he would have time to redeploy these troops north to defeat the other army.
Given the overwhelming numbers in the Russian forces, he realized that he was taking an enormous gamble. Hindenburg knew that if Rennenkampf moved quickly enough, he would open the road to Berlin, and the Russian general could trap the bulk of the German army in the south. However, there was a chance that Rennenkampf might not come to Samsonov's aid. Hoffmann told Hindenburg that the two Russian generals hated each other. Their animosity stretched back to the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, when they were colonels. This ongoing antagonism might now work for the Germans. Grand Duke Nicholas believed that his two generals had buried the hatchet long ago. He was still confident that his strategy was on course. Provided his two armies continued to advance simultaneously, he was convinced that speed, firepower, and overwhelming numbers would crush the Germans. General Jelinski, Grand Duke Nicholas's chief of staff, issued fresh orders for the advance to continue. But Samsonov's men were struggling to make swift progress through the difficult terrain in the south. Furthermore, his supply lines were becoming stretched, and his men were exhausted by days of forced marches on little food and water. Also, as Hoffman had predicted, Rennenkampf was reluctant to move quickly. Meanwhile, Hindenburg's quick mobilization of his forces against Samsonov was almost complete. The small hamlet of Tannenberg was now directly in the path of Samsonov's advance. Seven hundred fifty thousand German and Russian soldiers were poised for battle on the Eastern Front. In 1914, the Russian army of Grand Duke Nicholas was the largest in the world. Five million men could mobilize within weeks. The Russian soldiers were mainly peasants, but were formidable under strong leadership. They were used to living under the extremes, from frozen conditions in winter to the hot, parched Russian summers. However, their military training standards were inferior to Germany's. In 1914, most Russian soldiers were newly recruited with little or no combat experience. Their weapons, especially the artillery, were also inferior. Worst of all, the soldiers were led by an officer corps that had become known for its incompetence, sloth, and corruption. The only thing that the officers, including Grand Duke Nicholas and his men, had in common was their reverence for the Tsar, whom they regarded almost as a god. They also gained confidence from their strength in numbers. Many officers proclaimed that Quantity has a superior quality all of its own. Germany also had a rookie army, three million strong once the reserves were recalled. 
But unlike the Russians, German reserves underwent retraining every year. The officers, too, took their profession much more seriously than their Russian counterparts. Furthermore, the German army enjoyed a much higher standing in the country with the civilian population. Every element of the German army knew their exact roles. The Germans had another advantage, greater technology. Their medical services were efficient and highly regarded. At even the lowest level, German troops were well prepared. Unlike their opponents, they were issued with bivouacs to protect them from inclement weather. The rapid expansion of Germany's industrial base prior to the war had been largely geared to the armed forces. Weapons like the Krupp-built 77mm quick-firing field gun were the most modern of their type. The infantry's Maxim machine gun was one of the best yet manufactured. The German army had better radio and staff communications. The Germans also enjoyed superior road and rail links, which enabled them to move troops more rapidly than the Russians. They were excellent at constructing field defenses. Furthermore, the German general staff was considered the most efficient in the world. Above all, Hindenburg was universally trusted by both his soldiers and the German people. Now, as August drew to a close, both sides squared up for a defining and crucial clash of arms. General Paul von Hindenburg and Grand Duke Nicholas were putting the final touches on their battle plans. In the last week of August 1914, East Prussia had witnessed a massive redeployment of the German forces under Hindenburg, by foot and by rail. They had been sent south to counter the Russian offensive by General Samsonov's Second Army. Samsonov himself had been ordered by Grand Duke Nicholas to press on with all speed to cut off Hindenburg's forces. Samsonov mistakenly believed the advancing German troops to be weak and in disarray. In reality, Hindenburg had built up a powerful force to oppose him. General Hermann von Francois, commanding the 1st German Corps, was now ordered by Hindenburg to attack Samsonov. But he refused, explaining his troops had only just arrived and that they needed time to receive new orders, regroup, and rest before attacking.
Eric Ludendorff, the chief of staff, flew into a rage, but was calmed down by both Hindenburg and Hoffmann, who trusted von Francois's judgment. This trust was justified. Within 24 hours, Francois was on the move towards Samsonov's left flank. Encouraged by another intercepted Russian message that Samsonov was having difficulty, Hindenburg urged von Francois on. By August 26th, pressured by Grand Duke Nicholas, Samsonov was driving headlong into an elaborate trap. Suddenly, a storm of German artillery and machine gun fire struck the Russian troops. Numbed and shattered, Samsonov's leading divisions reeled backwards. Many gave up the fight and readily surrendered to Hindenburg's men. On August 27th, von Francois struck Samsonov's army in the flank. quickly went on the defensive. The German artillery mercilessly pounded them while the infantry swept through Russian lines with rifle fire. Seeing the Russians falter, the Germans then launched a determined assault. By evening, the Russians had lost 40,000 men and were falling back. Grand Duke Nicholas realized Samsonov's precarious situation and urgently ordered General Rennenkampf to advance rapidly to the southwest to reinforce him. The dire situation should have prompted Rennenkampf to Samsonov's rescue. However, as Hindenburg predicted, Rennenkampf still held a grudge and chose to ignore the wishes of his commander. Samsonov was left to salvage his flailing army on his own. In contrast, German General Hermann von Francois would disobey orders and get the results he planned for. On August 28th, with the Russian Second Army bogged down in the heavy woods around Tannenberg, Hindenburg ordered von Francois to prevent Samsonov's force from escaping to the west. But Francois had a more ambitious plan he was aiming to sever Samsonov's communications by striking east toward the village of Niedenburg. The village and its surroundings were first subjected to a murderous bombardment. The barrage and subsequent assault were part of a stunning act of bravura, which all but doomed the Russian Second Army. Hindenburg now ordered the remainder of his forces to encircle them to complete the annihilation of Samsonov's hapless army.
Von Francois's brilliant and creative disobedience earned him the nickname of the Fox. He had served Hindenburg well. As Samsonov's men struggled through the thick forests near Tannenberg, they began to lose their bearings. Hindenburg knew that the Russian Second Army was facing catastrophic defeat unless Grand Duke Nicholas could force his other army to come to the rescue. In the final days of August 1914, the relentless German attacks on the remnants of Samsonov's Second Army continued. In the north, Grand Duke Nicholas's other army was finally on the move, but heading west, away from Samsonov's army in the south. Another intercepted message from the Grand Duke's headquarters confirmed that Renenkamp's army was too far to come to Samsonov's aid. Hindenburg moved in for the kill. His infantry tightened the noose around the forest near Tannenberg. The Russians panicked, trying to evade their German hunters. It was hopeless. Samsonov's troops were in total disarray. Thousands threw down their arms and surrendered. Samsonov, a humiliated and broken man, resolved to do the honorable thing. On the evening of August 29th, he walked off into the woods. Minutes later, a single shot rang out. By the next day, the remnants of Samsonov's army had been systematically eradicated. The survivors were corralled like cattle into prisoner of war cages. Hindenburg's forces captured 93,000 Russians with 35,000 losses of his own men. Over 120,000 Russian soldiers had perished on the battlefield. The Germans also captured over 700 Russian artillery pieces. The disaster at Tannenberg left Grand Duke Nicholas with no option but to withdraw his remaining forces from East Prussia. Hindenburg moved quickly to cut them off. The Germans attacked on September 5th. By the 9th, Hindenburg's troops had captured 30,000 more prisoners. But unlike in Tannenberg, Renenkampf managed to extract part of his army and withdraw across the Russian border. The defeat at Tannenberg was a psychological blow to the Russian army from which it never recovered. Had Germany lost, Berlin would have been under direct threat and the course of the war might well have been dramatically different. General Paul von Hindenburg was promoted to field marshal. As the hero of Tannenberg, he became a national icon.
From the battle grew the partnership between Hindenburg and Ludendorff. They would oversee Germany's military strategy for the last two years of World War I. Following their defeat in the war, Hindenburg became president of the Weimar Republic. Later, he would attempt to limit the burgeoning power of Adolf Hitler, whom he disliked intensely. He would be forced to make him chancellor in January 1933. After an extraordinary life, Hindenburg died at 87 in August 1934. He was buried at a newly erected shrine near Tannenberg, the scene of his greatest triumph with full ceremony. In an ironic twist of fate, Hitler was the architect of Hindenburg's solemn and respectful funeral ceremony. With Hindenburg's death, Hitler was able to gain absolute power. He now set Germany on a course which would prove more disastrous than the dreadful years of World War I. After Tannenberg, Grand Duke Nicholas removed Jelinski and attempted to revive Russian military fortunes. Continuous poor leadership brought on further setbacks and the demoralization of Russian troops following the defeat at Tannenberg. Tsar Nicholas II assumed all command responsibilities in August 1915 and removed his uncle from command. It was to be a disastrous decision for Russia, leading to ultimate defeat. Grand Duke Nicholas then went to the Caucasus as governor general, where the Russians achieved a series of victories against the Turks. He continually pleaded with Tsar Nicholas to initiate much-needed reform in Russia. By then it was too late. During the Russian Revolution in November 1917, the Tsar and his family were arrested and later executed. Russia came under the iron grip of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Grand Duke Nicholas managed to escape Russia and went into exile in Italy and France, living quietly for the final decade of his life. Tannenberg was the most convincing and spectacular German victory in World War I. Russia never recovered. Disillusion increased after the mounting casualties and their defeat. This vulnerability opened the door for the Bolsheviks to seize power. As for the Tannenberg battle, Hindenburg's coolness and vast war experience proved too overwhelming for Grand Duke Nicholas of Russia.